This is a production of Cornell University. Wild tomato species using genome editing technology via CRISPR-Cas9. So as we know, the current agricultural uh, status and the war is that right now we are 8 billion people around the world and it's expected that for 2050, we're gonna be at almost 10 billion people and we just require that we increment our arable lands for 20% to feed all this amount of people. But as breeders, we know that the productivity in agriculture is not only defined by the, ar the availability of arable lands, but also by the different effects of or different factors like climate change effects and environmental deterioration that can be composed by biotic and abiotic factors. In the case of biotic factors, we are dealing with the salinization that is a really big problem around the world, who is affect, which is affecting hardly the yield of the crops. And it is expected or it is estimated that 20% of irrigated land around the world is, is compromised by this problem. And every year we are losing 10 mi um, millions of hectares of this land compromised by this concern. And it is also expected that for 2050, half of the arable lands around the world will be affected by salinization. In these pictures, I just want to show you that in the case, I or even extreme levels of sodic salinization. So tomato, why tomato was, as we know, tomato is a really important crop around the world with a annual production of 15 mi million of metric tons. And just in the United States, the market value for this crop is around 2.6 billion of annual farming gate value, in this case reported in 2015. But as we know, tomato is not only used for food, and Tomer is also a great model for studying genetics, uh, evolutionary biology, biotic and abiotic stresses responses. And thanks to the creation of the Tomato Genome Consortium in 2012 and the 100 Tomato Genome Sequencing Consortium in 2014, uh, a lot of research has been done on this in this regard. But tomato, as many other crops around the world, has suffered of the, of the domestication syndrome which decrease the genetic diversity of this plant and also the nutritional values to resistance of these plants and the fruit setting. Uh, as a result, we increase their fruit size and the yield in, in different ways by conventional breeding procedures. In this case, I just want to show you, for example, the wild ancestor of the tomato, the Solanum pimpel, and you by single mutations in these two genes. Uh, this evolved to the Solanum lycopersicum uh, that we no, now use for the cultivated tomato and the clear example of the change on the fruit. So for conventional breeding, uh, the use of wild species has been exploited a lot due to looking for increasing the genetic diversity of the crop and also looking for cues to increase the biotic and abiotic stress response of the cultivars. Uh, here, I just want to show you that according to the tomato clade, we have around 17, 17 species. In top, we can see the Solanum lycopersum, that is the cultivary one. And uh, many variation or genetic diversity have been found in other wild species in order to increase some traits on, the, on, on this cultivar. Uh, however, this is not always the case when we are talking about polygenic tricks like drought resistance or salinity resistance, core resistance. So in this case, this, uh, this experiment published in 2017 for a proposal by Benedito and Perez, they show or they perform experiment using a gradient of salt, in this case from 50 to 460 millimolar uh, of sodium chloride. And you can see that they start using this uh, accession of Solanum galapagensis, uh, accession LA1401, compared to the cultivar, the Solanum, uh, Solanum lycopersicum M82. Uh, and when the gradient increased uh, until 460 millimolar sodium chloride, only the accession from the Solanum galapagensis was able to survive on these conditions, while the cultivar is clearly 
here I'm dead. Also, thanks to a different approach or a different study published in 2017 by Pales, uh, she shows or she was trying to discern what, are, what, what were the mechanisms involved in the salinity resistance in Solanum schismani, that is also a, a closer relative to Solanum galapagensis. And she shows that there were two main uh, mechanisms involved in this, pro in this process, uh, sodium ex exclusion on the roots and also a compartmentalization of the sodium on the older leaves to keep a low uh, level of potassium. She shows that the best performed accession of this uh, species was the Solanum schismani accession 0421. So for the purposes of my research, I'm using this accession uh, I just want to show you here what is the phenotypic or the morphological characteristics of this plant uh, who is originally from the Galapagos Island and it, it grows close to the seashore in the, like you can see in this picture. It's an autogamous and self-compatible plant and the fruit that produces a really is a grape tomato, a yellowish tomato in, in the case. This is the picture of my fruits in the greenhouse. They look orangewish. So the main goal of my project is to develop a de novo domestication approach that was introduced by Sogon in 2017 that it states that instead of trying to introduce the alleles to improve uh, a, a complex trait like a polygenic trait into, into our cultivars, the idea is to introduce the already known domesticated alleles into the wild species to harbor their already occurring resistance to polygenic or to complex traits like salinity or drought or cold resistance. So to achieve this goal, I'm using CRISPR-Cas9 technology because as you know, it's a cheap, fast, simple and precise uh, technology. And also it allows you to, to do a multiplex fashion knockout of the, of the genes that you want to knock out. Well, these are the EGA genes that I'm using to knock out to generate single mutants in tomato. And these are the phenotypes that will be affected by this uh, loss, of, of, loss of function alleles. So these are the goals of my project. Uh, uh, by generating these knockouts in these genes, we're gonna uh, influence the, we're gonna try to achieve a compact plant structure, a uh, better flowering physiology, a higher yield, and a more nutritious fruit. These are the two uh, principal approaches that I'm taking. I'm generating these single mutants plants for this tomato, and also doing a parallel approach to knock out these five genes at the same time to generate or to affect these five phenotypes on the plant. Uh, by using transformation uh, by agrobacterium to mephachines, we are using the cells for, from cotyledons. Here I just want to show you the explants to promote the shoot development, then we promote the root development, then we transfer them to soil conditions and we acclimatize the plants before transfer them to the greenhouse facilities. In this case, I'm just showing you two of the mutant lines that we already have there growing. Until now, these are my preliminary results. We were having, we were performing a lot of transformations for all the genes, uh, the single knockouts, and also we're still go keep going with the multiplex knockout. So the next steps is to keep going with the agrobacterium to mephachine transformation on the tomato and the cotyledons tissue, and then wait for the, regenera the proper regeneration of the plants, and then confirm these mutations by PCR. And well, I think I go, I went a little bit, a little bit fast. Well, I just want to acknowledge my team of the, my colleagues that were there the last year helping me a lot with experiments. And of course, my advisor, the Dr. Wagner Benedito from the Department of Soil Science, Plant and Soil Science from West Virginia University, and the Dr. Lázaro Perez, who is working with us in collaboration from Brazil. And of course, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, who is helping me to do my master's here in the United States, and the respective institutions of my colleagues who were there working with me along this work. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to hear your questions. If there are something that you want to ask, I'm gonna check the, uh, Thank you, the chat. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
if uh, people have questions, please feel free to either write those in the chat or to raise your hand and ask them directly. I am trying to find the chat. Okay. Is there any question? It looks like there's one in the chat right now from Jarrett Mann and then another another one from Anna Herman. So. Uh, yeah, I can see now. No. H. I can see the chat. Could you help me reading the questions, please, Sarah? Of course. Jarrett, would you like to read your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so that was great. Thank you. Um, I know that the, the Solanum family does tend to um, produce compounds that are not desirable in our crops. And I was wondering if there was any idea, if there, if I don't know, Chismani, I don't know if they, they make anything that okay. we would like to get rid of, but if this technique could be used for that. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the reasons that we select Solanum Chismani to do this, uh, this research was because Solanum Chismani is one of the uh, couple of wild species that don't have these kind of issues. For example, the Solanum penelli produce some compounds that are toxic for, for consuming. But in the case of Solanum Shismani, actually it's a really sweet fruit. It's a small, it's a grapefruit, but it's one of the ones that have a highest bricks, bricks level. And no, it's not toxic. So it's, uh, that's why we select this uh, plant too, besides the salinity tolerance. Yeah, I don't know if that answers the, your entire question. Yeah, that's good, thanks. Thank you. Anna, what about you? Can you ask your question? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, so I was wondering if you could repeat how many domestication genes you know that you have to transfer in the wild type tomato plant, and um, if you can kind of speed up this domestication process. Yeah, of course we are. Well, these are the two approaches that we are using to promote or to develop the single mutant plants, we are using eight genes. But in the case for the multiplex knockout, we are using these five genes that will affect uh, these different phenotypes. So yeah, beef sick B, that it will be increased, will increase the lycopene content of the fruit and these other architect, arch architectural uh, plant phenotypes. What was your second question, sorry? Oh, I was mainly if um, you know if these are all the important genes or if you know that there's like a black box that's still missing of domestication genes. Oh yeah, of course there are another ones, but uh, for example, there was a paper published a recent years ago. They knock out or they create a loss of functional in six genes. They actually, they use uh, some of the similar genes that I'm selecting here, but of course there are more that can be improved in a in a research for our research purposes. Uh, we select this because we only want to create uh, a compact architecture plant. And of course there could be others that could be also involved in these ones, but according to the literature research that we made, uh, we decide that it will be the best ones to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have one last question from Hussein Azimi. Hussein? Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I wonder that, uh, you know, in Turkey we have a uh, very problem with biosafety regulation. Uh, if we use uh, CRISPR-Cas, so will it be transgenic or not? Well, of course, that will depend on the regulation and, and, well, the regulation that we are working with, right? But in the case of the United States, it is that, it, that is using a process-based uh, regulation uh, um, ground. We can say that in the case if we are using CRISPR-Cas9 to only make some tweaks on the genome of the crop, it won't be considered uh, transgenic in the case of the United States because uh, the, um, well, it is a process that is not uh, covered by the, by the, well, the, it is not considered a, a genome modified crop due to that because it, it uh, is, uh affecting only the, it is used only on the process, not on the product, on the final product. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
I'm trying to see if there are another question. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, I think those are all right. There's one last question from Julia and Lennis, it looks like, and we have just about, well, just about a few minutes okay. left. Okay, do you have any idea how many genes are involved in saltorians in Shismani? Oh, uh, well, uh, we know that uh, at least not as, as particularly in Shismani, but we know that there's a, a really complex net of many genes involved, at, at least till now, that were found in different uh, plants and uh, and um, well, see, and plants. In the case of Shismani, according to this paper uh, by Pales in 2017, she shows, uh, she mentions and she proposed some genes, but of course, most of them are not known or well differentiated till now. Uh, we hope that we can find some uh, issues or some more insights into this matter. But for now, the specific genes are, and, the, and the entire net of genes is not well identify or describe. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Estefania. Um, if you this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.